Robert Maurer, welcome to the show. It's a pleasure to be here. So you wrote a book called One Small Step Can Change Your Life, The Kaizen Way. Before we get into what Kaizen is, because we're going to get into detail what that is, how did you get started into researching this this Japanese, well, it's a manufacturing philosophy, really, that got exported back to the United States. But how did you, what's your background to where you got interested in this? Well, I'm a clinical psychologist, and I have an unusual position. I work in a family medicine a clinic, a family medicine residency clinic. So we're training family practice doctors. So I get to go in the room and see uh, the physicians as they interview uh, patients for all the things that bring people to a primary care clinic. So here was an opportunity to try to identify people at risk for future problems and try to help them before they had made poor marital choices, before their children started developing problems, before they got depressed. But we had no tools. So long story short, I began uh, researching long-term studies where they follow people from birth until they were 40, 50, 60, 70 years old to see what skills allowed people in spite of adversity and setbacks to continue to thrive, not just in jobs, not just in health, not just in relationships, but all three. And there were just about two dozen studies that have done this. And um, But what led me to Kaizen was um, seeing that I, I, one day I was looking at a newspaper article and it said that the Toyota Lexus for the umpteenth year was the most uh, high quality car made. And I thought, well, maybe there's something metaphorically about building a car that I could use to help people build their lives. And that led me to a book called The Machine That Changed the World, which you think would be about computers, but it's actually about cars. And that led me to Dr. Deming and Kaizen. Okay, so it all started with helping people make big changes in their life that are good for themselves and making sure those changes endure. That's a big problem, right, in, in the medical field, making sure people take their medications, making sure people eat right, making sure people exercise. Exactly. For our, our audience who aren't familiar with Kaizen, can you tell us what it is? Like, what are the, What's the big tenet in like, the history of its development? Well, it was, in some ways, a two-pronged story. In the one sense, it's an ancient Asian philosophy. The journey of a thousand miles begins with a single step. Because Kaizen has two definitions, Brett. The one is making extremely small steps in order to accomplish a large goal. And the other definition is looking at very, very small moments to learn large lessons. But the modern history of it is, as you know, the U.S. entered World War II very suddenly with very little human or material resource. So a group of Americans led by a man named Edward Deming tried to, as we were turning car factories into tank factories with very little resource, tried to help make the products as good as they could. So they would tell each worker on the assembly line, can see if you can find even the smallest ways to try to improve the process of the product. Because again, we couldn't make big wholesale changes. And they found to their surprise, these very small incremental changes led to big innovative results. And so that the idea of taking small steps to accomplish large goals became part of the manufacturing process. After World War II, Deming and his colleagues introduced this to Japan as they were rebuilding out of the rubble of the war. And uh, small struggling firms like Toyota embraced Kaizen, they call it their soul, to, and began building some of the highest quality products in the world. And so, yeah, with the Kaizen, with the car manufacturing, basically the, the manufacturer, the company, gave the on-the-ground employees the permission to stop the conveyor belt, so to speak, and make those changes, which was often unheard of in American factories. Like, you never stopped the conveyor belt. Like, you kept it going no matter what. But there, they were like, stop it. If you can improve it, let's do that right then and there. Exactly. It's one of the ways that Kaizen works in terms of preventing mistakes. Because, uh, as, as you say very, very well, prior to Deming and Kaizen, uh, cars would go down the assembly line, and at the end of the line, workers would look to see how many problems there were. And no matter how much you paid for the car, whether it was a Ford or a Ferrari, you still came back to the dealer a week later with 10 things that needed to be fixed. Well, Deming and his colleague at Toyota named Taiichi Ono decided we're not going to do that. Cars going down the assembly line, as you pointed out, and somebody sees a scratch on the fender, they stop the assembly line bring in the supplier, the engineer, and tried to fix it there. And everybody thought Deming was crazy. How can you mass manufacture a product when you're stopping it every few feet to fix it? 
turned out to be the most efficient way to build cars. And since then, every, everybody's adopted that philosophy. And actually, what ended up happening were the Japanese manufacturers, Toyota in particular, like they started beating the big car, American car companies, Ford, Chevy. And like GM actually sent people to Toyota to figure out, okay, how can we implement this Kaizen? So it was, it was kind of weird. Like it started in the United States, went to Japan, and then Americans had to go back to Japan to rediscover this thing. <laughs> It's very true. That's exactly the history of it. Yeah. In some ways, it makes sense because after World War II, we were the only industrial giants still standing. People were buying our cars and refrigerators no matter how we built them. So until the Japanese started to really make inroads into our consumer world, nobody got interested in Deming and Kaizen. What's interesting is like why – I mean, so these car companies saw what Deming was doing, right, with to, with the, democ- the, the armory of democracy, right, building these things really fast and it was working. Why did they decide like, nah, we're going to go back to the way we used to do things um, before the war? I think they probably assumed it was cheaper. Um, if you're building 7,000 cars a day, it just seemed logical to keep the assembly line moving and fix the problems later. It just, it just seemed logical to them. And because they had no competition and a huge uh, consumer base of soldiers coming back from the war wanting to buy new cars, it was hard for them to try to take a, a harder look at what was happening. Even when the Japanese started to make huge inroads, they assumed it was because the Japanese workers were more docile, that it was an easier environment for manufacturers. It took them a long time to decide, all right, I guess we have to adopt this. Right. And I think in the book you highlight, there was this one particular GM factory. It was like the worst factory, GM factory in America, but they brought in people from Toyota and they basically, they turned this thing around. Like what happened there? It's an amazing story because I've, I have heard interviews with the workers at Fremont. It was originally a General Motors factory and evidently, uh, workers thought the management was so hostile, so harsh, that the workers actually admitted they were sabotaging the cars. So uh, General Motors closed the factory down. Well, as Toyota was starting and Honda was starting to make huge inroads, um, General Motors got desperate and they took a, their, their design of the car and they took the same hostile workers back, and this time they used Deming's management methods, including Kaizen, and at the same time, they were automating as many of their factories as they could. Well, a year later, the the highest quality cars in the entire General Motors line were the ones built with these workers in Fremont. I heard the same workers interviewed after Toyota took over, and some of them, believe it or not, would actually go to the showroom now, uh, the, the the dealer showrooms and watch people test drive the car. They had such pride in what they were doing. So it turned out it wasn't the car. It wasn't the it wasn't the labor problems. It would turned out it was the manufacturing process that gave people dignity and a sense of importance that Kaizen provided. Because what Kaizen asked each worker to do is to go to work each day, thinking what small step could I possibly take to improve the process or product. So people went to to work with a sense of creativity and empowerment that nobody had vested them with ever, ever before. And speaking of how they were, you know, sabotaging the cars, like I think they were leaving whiskey bottles and door frames and things like that. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Imagine how angry these people were. It's just hard to fathom knowing they were putting their jobs at risk that they were that angry. So yeah, Kaizen, it's all about empowering people on the ground, making small incremental changes. This goes against sort of the grain, what we think of how change is done. In your experience with working with patients, working with doctors, and just working with other individuals in this sort of behavior change, what are the big myths that people have about change, both personally and in an organization? Well, the best, it's a great question. The best answer is to go back and kind of define the alternative to Kaizen. Because basically, what the Western notion of change is what we call innovation, which we define as taking the largest possible steps to accomplish a large goal. And for many people and many organizations, that's the only way they think of change. We're going to bring in some consultants and design some new pro- new program. It's going to cost a fortune to implement. If I want to lose weight, I'm going to go to the gym, get a trainer, go on a radical diet. We tend to think in terms of big problem and big solution. It goes completely against the Western mindset to think that we could get to the same goal, sometimes even faster with small steps as opposed to big, huge leaps. 
And as everyone listening to this has discovered, at some point in our lives, sometimes those big steps lead to big falls. And sometimes the price of that fall is more than we ever bargained to pay. So it isn't that we're making, trying to make innovation bad or wrong, but the question is, if it's not practical or hasn't worked, are you free to take very small steps to accomplish the same goal? So the, the, the biggest myth, to go back to your question, is thinking that, the first of all, that the only way to change is through big steps. And the second big myth is to think that basically you're trying to make it to decide, all right, am I going to take a, particularly in the creative process, am I going to take a small step or a big step? Because when you look at creativity, because one of our research projects, we looked at breakthrough products, everything from the internet to the microwave uh, to barcodes. Um, and so many great inventions came from some incredibly small, inconsequential moment that somebody got intrigued with, and out of that small curiosity, breakthrough products came. Whether it's Disney World or Disneyland, the credit card, I could get, take you through any and all of those. They were all with some incredibly ridiculously small moment. Somebody thought, now that's interesting. Yeah, it's interesting. Like you said, like we, we put this premium on innovation, and we think innovation just happens like, it's like sort of like this lightning bolt from the heavens. But as you say, really, most innovation, it's very slow, and it's the result of small steps till you got to that point. Yeah, it's the old story we all grew up with, the children's story of the tortoise and the hare. We just thought it was a children's story and not a metaphor for our lives. So besides manufacturing companies, I mean, how have you seen Kaizen be incorporated in the lives of regular folks? For example, with your work with doctors and helping the helping patients, you know, live healthier lives. I mean, what have what have like what are some of the, the success stories you've seen? The value to Kaizen, particularly in a medical setting, is that you're trying to get people to make life changes. And everybody that walks through the door of a clinic, and I'm sure everybody listening to this knows that we should exercise, we should eat well, we should get enough sleep, we should drink more water. Uh, this is not a mystery, but everybody's got very good reasons why they don't have the time, the energy, or it just seems overwhelming. So getting somebody that's got a, um, a job and children to raise or all kinds of responsibilities for our elderly parents, any of those kinds of things will say, you're crazy. I don't have, if I had time to do that, I would. But can you get somebody to exercise one minute a day, every day? Um, can you get somebody, for example, to, what happens, of course, is if you're exercising a minute a day, after a while, what tends to happen is you develop a habit and it starts to increase. I remember years ago, before I ever met Dr. Deming and discovered Kaizen, there was a world-famous pain expert at UCLA giving a two-night course for people with cancer pain. And at the end of the first night, he said to the group, I want you all to go home and meditate for one minute. Well, I thought that was the dumbest idea I ever heard of. So I waited for the audience to leave, and as politely as I could, I asked the professor, why one minute? It's not enough to do anybody any good. He very patiently asked me, how old is meditation? I said, thousands of years old. He said, that's absolutely correct. There's a very good chance everybody in this room has heard of meditation before tonight. Those who like the idea have already found a book or a teacher and they're doing it. For the rest of the people in this room, meditation's the worst idea they ever heard of. I'd rather they go home and meditate for one minute than not meditate for 30. They may discover they like it. They may forget to stop, which is what all the current research on Kaizen argues if you can get people to put a toe in the water to start something, it'll eventually become a habit. We'd like people to drink more water. So getting people just to put a bottle of water at their desk, another in the car, another where they shave or put on their makeup, and you're developing a pattern. Because the good news is the brain's a creature of habit. The bad news is the brain's a creature of habit. Anything you do regularly, the brain starts to commit cells to. Simplest example I can think of is advertising. You know, if you draw two golden arches and ask people what it is, they'll say McDonald's. And some of these people have never set foot in one of their restaurants, but they've seen those 15-second commercials over and over and over again. And so they can tell you three or four of the products of a, of a restaurant they've never been into. So advertisers know repetition is what the brain decides is important. So if you can get people to do something just, uh, just momentarily, just for a 15 seconds, 30 seconds a minute, you can get people to make changes. There's a wonderful Kaizen technique called mind sculpture. There's a book by that name that takes people through the technical parts of it. 
in my book talks about the applications of it. And what it is, they discovered uh, in some athletes who had injured themselves and who recovered much faster than anybody dreamed, they were using this technique called mind sculpture. You can use it for sports. You can use it for public speaking. You can use it if you're afraid to go out on a date. You can even use it to exercise. And what it, it's based on the premise that um, if you close your eyes, imagine yourself, for example, in the gym, picturing lifting, reaching down to lift the weights. And again, you're, you're, you're not moving a muscle. You can feel the muscles in your arms start to tense. You can feel your breathing increase. Again, in retrospect, based on, a, based on a simple principle, with your eyes closed, your brain is so stupid it doesn't know where it is and is sending perfect messages to the body. So if I'm, if, I have to, if I'm afraid of public speaking and I close my eyes, picture myself in a classroom uh, with 30 students, half of them on their smartphones, 25% of them still sleeping, uh, but I imagine what I'd say, voice, tone, gestures, just 15, 20, 30 seconds at the most at a time, one, two, three times a day at most, again, eventually the brain decides this is important and commits cells to it. So you can do something just a few seconds at a time like you do watching commercials, um, and eventually the brain decides this is important and commits, commits the body to it. So it's a wonderful technique for people that would like to make changes but have close to no motivation at all because mind sculpture takes almost no, no time. According to the research in this book, right, you're actually, if, you're, if you're doing that with exercise, I'll actually do it on an airplane, close my eyes and imagine I'm in the gym or running, and according to the data, you're burning 25% of the calories you'd actually burn in real time and uh, the brain's practicing doing it perfectly. So basically, you take any any task that you're you're feeling overwhelmed by, you're putting off, and just mentally rehearsing you're doing it. Yeah. And I guess the trick is to get as vivid as possible with it. Yes, as much as you can. Again, your inner your inner visions are never as um, clear as the outside ones. But you're picking the, the the book starts off with a very famous British javelin Olympic athlete who had injured his shoulders a few months before the Olympics was obviously had his arm in a tourniquet, but imagined himself in the Olympic stadium reaching for the javelin and picking it up and throwing it again while he was his shoulder and arm was immobile and went on to win a medal uh, just because he, had, again, practiced it perfectly. Some, some of the Olympic ski teams spend half their time practicing in a classroom going down the mountain in their mind because, again, the muscles are practicing doing it right instead of practicing falling. So that's that's an easy first step. Just thinking about doing the thing and visualizing it. You're not just thinking about it. Yeah, visualizing it is key. All right. So let's look at some more of the more brass tack things that people can do with kaizen. And like you said, a lot of this stuff it's gonna seem it's gonna seem like the doc the guy who said just meditate for a minute. You're like, how's this gonna work? So like in the book, you talk about one of the first steps is to ask small questions. So what do you mean by? I mean, what are some examples of small questions and trying to apply kaizen to a, a task? And that that one I stole from De Deming and Toyota. Because when, when, as Toyota was rebuilding after the war, Deming simply asked each of the Toyota workers to ask themselves a question. And the question was, what small trivial step could I take that may improve the process or product? What Deming suspected, and we still believe to be true, though nobody knows why, is the brain cannot reject a question. Any question you ask repeatedly, the brain's compelled to pay attention to and start its own Google search. It's a really bizarre uh, finding about the brain. If I'm doing a five-day program, say, in a hotel for a group, and I'll say to them first day, uh, what color car is parked three cars to the right of yours in the parking lot? They look at me like, that's the dumbest question I ever heard. I mean, of course it is. I ask them the same stupid question on Tuesday. By Wednesday at the earliest, Brett, Thursday at the latest, pulling into the parking lot with far more interesting things on their mind a place in the brain with the funny name of hippocampus will say to them, that fool's going to ask me again about the color of the car, and they're forced to store an answer in short-term memory. The brain cannot reject the question. The trick is that the question has to be small enough that it doesn't make the person afraid. So if, I, if the question I ask is, how can I be thin by the end of the month? How am I get married by the end of the year? How am I going to make a fortune in the next six months? The bigger the question, the more it triggers fear in the brain and overwhelms the creative process. If you make the question small and trivial, but ask it each day, whether it's what, would, what, what activity would make me more joyful in life, or what it is, what it is 
I, I could do in the next week or so that would make me more productive. Just asking the question patiently once or twice a day and the brain takes on the Google search. And as every one of your listeners can probably attest, all of us have had the experience where you're in the shower, you're driving to work, and all of a sudden you've got a solution to a problem because the brain percolated on it and eventually in its own inefficient but magnificent way uh, solve the problem. That's great. So let's give like specific examples here. Let's say someone is trying to pay off their student loans, right? And I guess the wrong question would be, how can I pay off my student loans by the end of the year? If, and again, the only, because again, we're not trying to make innovation bad or wrong. You could ask that question and if all of a sudden you get a great answer, that's fantastic. Most of us get stuck and overwhelmed by the question, which is what you're suggesting. So the alternative would be, um, what small step could I take today that could uh, save me of, uh, save me some money, whether it's um, instead of getting Starbucks, going to 7-Eleven for coffee, whether it's taking a, a bike instead of the bus, any small way you can begin to reduce your financial expenditures. Now you think, well, I got $30,000 in debt and you want me just to save $2 on a cup of coffee? You're right. It's not going to, it'll take you to, two generations to pay off the debt, but you're training the brain to start to look for ways to save money. And so uh, you're programming the brain for a process you wanted to engage in. So that would be one way to deal with. Uh, another, would, another, using that same example, just asking the question, um, who, who can I ask that could help me find ways to, to manage this debt any more creatively? Uh, just asking the question once a day. And eventually you may find yourself uh, looking at government agencies, looking at, at different programs, because there's a dozen different programs to help student, student debt get resolved. But um, the idea of sitting down and spending two hours on the Internet can be overwhelming to people. The idea of just asking the question and letting the brain percolate on it may be a much easier and more acceptable uh, strategy. Right. So you're basically trying to kickstart your brain into thinking small with these small questions. And when those will sort of... It'll, it'll snowball eventually. With the question thing, I thought this is a great opportunity to use Kaizen with other people, like say you're a manager or even a parent. This would be a great opportunity. Like questions are a great way to help others implement Kaizen in their own life. It's a good good coaching opportunity. Yes, exactly. In fact, I was listen, I was watching an interview on um, a TV show with Yo-Yo Ma, the most famous cellist and one of the most famous musicians in the world. And he was talking about the fact his father set very high standards but each day, very, very small steps that he could accomplish. So the idea of creating small victories allows the team to develop, allows confidence to develop. And the other thing about small steps, particularly in the workplace, is you don't know which small step is going to turn out to be huge. As I said, there's so many breakthrough products from the credit card to Disneyland that turned that was some small moment, that the laser um, that nobody thought was going to turn out to be because you don't know when you take a small step what's going to end up staying small and what's going to become huge. Yeah, I was thinking this would be like my my kids, like whenever they get frustrated, instead of like trying to figure it out for themselves, like instead of doing it for them, it's like ask them a stupid small question and help them solve their own problem. We talked about mind sculptures. That's basically thinking very small thoughts. And again, people might think, okay, how is just visualizing me doing the task is going to help, but as you said, it can help a lot. But then after thinking small thoughts and using this visualization practice, which doesn't take hardly any time at all, you can do it while you're on an airplane, we got to take small actions. I mean, how small are we talking here? I mean, is it, is it like literally like a minute of meditation small, like where that's not going to, like we're going to think, like basically is the, the, the threshold, like that's not going to do anything. Is that when you know you've gotten small enough? Um, the, the criteria for the smallness is the step is so ridiculously small that it requires no willpower, self-control, or discipline. Um, that there's, no, there's not going to be any pushback. That's how you know it's a small enough step. And a lot of it's in the mind of the beholder. So for some people that hate exercise, feel overwhelmed by their life, if they can exercise, if they can stand in front of the TV during one commercial... Uh, or at least you know the six, 60 seconds that the commercials run, uh, and just walk in place as fast as they can during one commercial or doing two commercials, whatever's doable, um, then eventually they start to develop. You know, when, If you talk to anybody who exercises, they, initially they hated it, then they tolerate it, now they miss it if they don't do it. So you're trying to develop a habit, and you do that a minute at a time. 
Um, my favorite example is it was done in Pittsburgh and then it was done in Ireland where they went into a huge high rise building, went to the sixth floor, found a of people and said, congratulations, who did, hadn't exercised since high school, said, congratulations, Christmas has come early. Here is a lifetime gift certificate to the health club across the street, a gift certificate for your trainer for a year. Went to the 12th floor of the same building, another dozen people in a different firm that hadn't exercised since high school. All they asked them to do on Monday was go into the stairwell, go up one flight of stairs, back to their floor, back to their desk, back to work. Tuesday, go into the stairwell, go up one flight out a single step, back to their floor, back to their desk, back to work. Wednesday, two steps. You get the idea. Every day of the work week, adding one step to this ridiculous regimen. But come back one year, three years, five years later, which of those two groups do you think is exercising better with better cardiovascular fitness, lower cholesterol, lower weight? The people with the health club or the steppers? And, of course, the answer, I think, is pretty obvious, the steppers. So if you can get people to do whatever it is they're resistant to for whatever number of minutes, they are sure they can do it because it requires no conscious effort on their part, then eventually the brain develops a habit for it. Um, there's research out of Texas showing if you can exercise, if you exercise three minutes at a time, 10 times a day, you get most, not all of the same cardiac benefit you would get from exercising 30 minutes. And of course, it's a lot easier to find three minutes at work to take a quick walk around the block or go up two flights of stairs than it is to go to the gym for a half hour in the middle of a work day. That's crazy. And so, I mean, you could, uh, yeah, you can use this for paying off debt. So it's like, I'm going to save a dollar today. Have you seen this used, this small step used to help people quit smoking in your work? Yes. Yeah. For some people, innovation is the answer to smoking. Because I, I just saw a person this morning that uh, woke up one day and decided to quit and she's now 30 days without smoking. Now that looks like innovation, uh, but it's deceptive because if you ask her, uh, how long have you been thinking about quitting? It's been a slow incremental process of kind of contemplating, consideration, discussion, and, and debate within her mind before that fateful day when people made the leap into innovation. So sometimes the steps, I'm sorry, I lost your question, but so, sometimes the small steps lead to, to big ones that the person hadn't even anticipated. But I think I lost your question, Brett. <laughs> Sorry. No, yeah, that's fine. No, you were talking about smoking, like using small steps to quit smoking. Oh, smoking. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, so sometimes innovation, in fact, when you look at the research, cold turkey, the person just got up that day and quit. It looks like innovation, but in fact, uh, is usually something the person contemplated for weeks, months, or years before that fateful day. The other way uh, Kaizen's used for smoking, cut the cigarette down or you just, you, you, you only smoke half of it. Or the, the one, one of the big problems for people who have trouble quitting is that they need a cigarette the moment they get up in the morning. And so you ask them if they're willing to either take a shower first, have a cup of coffee first, wait another 30 seconds or a minute before they have that first cigarette. Because all of the most successful uh, habit-breaking techniques for smoking involve making small changes um, so instead of having the cigarette in, in your car, can you stand outside the car? Can you have the coffee without the cigarette? Just trying to break the patterns that smoking is associated with. Get rid of the ashtrays in your house, those kinds of things. Anything that breaks up the, the habit of having the, associating the cigarette either with um, certain friends or with this, the coffee or with car or whatever, so um, those are some of the ways we use uh, Kaizen for cigarettes, particularly in people that are really struggling with it. And in the book, you, you give great other great examples of you know, habits that people, I'm sure a lot of people have tried starting their own life. But if you apply Kaizen to it, your success rate will go up significantly. Like journal writing, a lot of people are like, I'm going to write in my journal every day. And they think they have to write for 30 minutes. But you say, no, just write for a minute and then add a minute every week or so. Yes. In fact, I can give you a personal example because when I got the contract to write this book, I do not like to write. It's one of my least favorite things to do on the planet. And so I thought, well, let's see if Kaizen works. So I, I, the contract gave me a year to write the book. Um, and so I said, all right, I'm going to just write. All, all, I'm, all I'm promising to do is to write 60 seconds a day. That's it. And if I've done that, it's a success. And, of course, like with the meditation at the UCLA professor, um, it, originally I just kept to my agreement, but eventually, of course, I forgot to stop. And that's what you're counting on with Kaizen. You're building a habit. 
The other way Kaizen works, Brett, is that you're, you're programming the brain for the leap you want it to make. Let me give you a simple example. If I have a room full of people and I say, how many of you remember the exact instant when you master driving? Nobody raises their hand. We all remember kind of lurching through a grocery store parking lot with this car we could barely control. Um, and yet at some point you're driving down the highway uh, completely absorbed by the conversation with your passenger or by the, uh, the conversation on the radio, completely oblivious to the fact the brain is now making very complex life-saving decisions moment by moment while we're behind the wheel of a car. The brain learned it incrementally and made the leap into innovation on its own. So, again, there's an artificial distinction between Kaizen and innovation. Even big steps uh, usually are preceded by many small ones. Also kind of coupled with small actions, you also encourage reinforcing these actions with small rewards. So how, how would that look on a practical level? Sometimes people think, well, when I lose all this weight, I'm going to go out and buy a new wardrobe, and I'm going to do this and do that. Um, if you can find some very small way to reward yourself, again, usually not with food unless that's not an issue for you, even if it's just calling up a friend who's going to say, great work, or calling up somebody to brag, uh, anything positive that you're going to allow yourself to do um, at the same time or afterwards. One of the ways I got myself to floss, because flossing is one of the most useful things you can do for your health. It actually helps prevent heart disease, believe it or not. But I just never had time for it. So what I would do is I'd put the floss right on top of the remote control so that while I was watching TV, I could floss. So if you can associate something you don't want to do with something you love, then um, it tends to be easier. Maybe that's why all these new gyms have fancy TVs in front of the treadmills so that you can do something you love while you're doing something you just as soon not have to do. I think that's called, a, there's a paper I think read about, it's like temptation bundling is what it's called. I think I've, I've heard it referred to as that, yeah. And in business... One of the things that, that we now have enormous research on is that giving big rewards for big suggestions turns out to be a bad idea. The average award in a U.S. car factory, if you make a big suggestion, is over $400. In Toyota, it's $3. Now, the difference is people have to feel they're being paid fairly for their labors or all bets are off. But if you think there's a big reward waiting for a big, what are you looking for? You want the big reward and for $450, Am I going to share it with the three people next to, standing next to me on the assembly line? Not very likely. So they found that small amounts, $3 or less, and you get, you get on the average of 100 more uh, um, suggestions from an employee than if you're offering them $400. But again, they have to feel they're being paid fairly. So we've been talking using Kaizen to solve big problems, right? It's that going back to that, that Chinese phrase, you know, journey of a thousand steps, a thousand miles begins with a single step. But you also talk about you can, you can use Kaizen in a way, like you know, instead of solving big problems using Kaizen, using Kaizen to find small problems that you can fix that will provide a big payoff in your life. Any examples of that? Yeah, because uh, when you look at so many breakthrough products, that they turned out to be some small frustration that other people just kind of endured. This person got intrigued with. We got the credit card from two New York City attorneys who were out, out to dinner arguing about the check until they both realized they didn't have any money. Fortunately, one of them lived a few blocks from the restaurant. He called his wife. She came down with some cash on the walk back to the apartment. Um, the two of them remembered that moment's embarrassment in the restaurant and thought, well, there has to be an easier way to, to pay for rest, restaurant bills than Diners Club. Our first credit card was invented that night. Um, the, the stories going around about Uber and Airbnb are about people who, again, had just a small idea. The Air, Airbnb story has been told many times that these two guys who were just about to leave their apartment, um, and there was a big convention in San Francisco. There was a, a shortage of rooms, so they put a, a list on Craigslist just to... Um, rent out their, their um, air mattresses, which is how they got their name, and that led to air, air, Airbnb. Um, and we got barcodes from a guy that was trying to figure out how to help grocery stores with their checkout process, couldn't figure out what to do. One day in complete frustration, he goes off to the beach, sticking his hand in the sand in frustration, took his hand out, saw the sand sticking to the grooves on his fingers, and thought that's it, and barcodes were invented that day. So, so many breakthrough products and ideas come from some momentary frustration or annoyance or irritation. Somebody thought, you know, I think there's an idea here on how to make it better. 
And so like, look for those small annoyances in your life and, and fix them. And you'd be surprised how much that will improve your life, just getting rid of those annoyances. Exactly. And it may turn out to be something that the rest of the world is interested in too. Right, right. You know, an example from my, my father-in-law, they, uh, his gar- the garbage can in their house was like you know, under a sink where a lot of people keep their garbage can. But uh, it was annoying because it, the garbage can didn't come out. And so like, you, know, you, put, you throw stuff in there, but sometimes it wouldn't make it. And so you'd have to like, dig in the back to like, find the trash that didn't make it to the garbage can. So he decided to like, make this pull-out thing that he puts the garbage can on. And so you can pull the garbage can out, throw it away, then push it back in. And he says like, it's, it's been, it was a big improvement in his life. It was like a daily annoyance of his and he fixed it. It took, you know, 20 minutes and it might seem stupid and insignificant, but like, it's one of those, it's like an example of like a little thing that can improve your life significantly. Yes. And sometimes, again, sometimes those things lead to products that the world's waiting for too. They, they just didn't know they were waiting for it. Right. Yeah. As you, you do this Kaizen process, you build up this habit, this, you're building up habit. You're creating this new groove in your brain. Does this carry over into other domain, tran, you know, does it transfer over to other domains of your life? Say if you use Kaizen to, I don't know, start exercising regularly, will that allow you to take on other challenges easier because you've developed that ability, like that Kaizen process within you? Yeah, that's what all the research argues. For And the obvious example is the one you gave where if you start exercising, all of a sudden you're kind of thinking twice before having that second uh, donut because you're going to have to drag that Uh, extra weight around when you go around the block tomorrow. So exercise tends to increase your interest in taking better care of yourself in other areas. So yeah, it it doesn't work in in a couple ways, but one of them we think is once you start having small victories, uh, you then start wanting to have more small victories, which leads you to look for other places in your life where you can make small changes. So just starting to throw away the first two bites of a donut and eating the rest of it, eventually what you're training the brain is, I don't have to eat everything I see. So now the thing that makes Kaizen hard is that many of us, myself included, we tend to make changes when life, when we've made a mistake in life. So it's those decade birthdays when you think about, oh my God, I wish I had spent more time doing whatever, or uh, your doctor scares you with a diagnosis or relationship ends. And many of us at that point are pretty angry with ourselves that we've done something foolish and then when you're angry at yourself, it's hard to think about small steps. You want to correct the problem yesterday so this voice in your head will stop telling you what a loser you are. So in addition to kind of our cultural f- focus on innovation, um, it's hard for some people to adopt Kaizen because they're so angry at themselves. They're desperate for improvement. And I think the other hard part about Kaizen is that it can be, it's so easy that you don't believe it's going to work. Exactly. Yep. And that's why I wrote the book was so people could see all the research on it. Um, but it, you're right. It defies common sense. Doesn't seem logical or possible uh, to accomplish in small steps. What a big leap would. Well, Robert, this has been a great conversation. Where can people go to learn more about the book and your work? Uh, there's a website, scienceofexcellence.com, which has a lot of the research that we've been talking about. And uh, the, the book on Kaizen that you've been referencing, One Small Step Can Change Your Life. There's also a second book, on how to apply Kaizen in the workplace called The Spirit of Kaizen. And my latest book is about uh, that what makes Kaizen so powerful, and that is that it, it is kind of uh, quiets the fear mechanism in the brain. So the third book is called Mastering Fear. Fantastic. We'll be sure to link to those in the show notes. Robert, thank you so much for your time. It's been an absolute pleasure. And the same for me. I appreciate your questions very much. My guest today was Robert Maurer. He's the author of the book, One Small Step Can Change Your Life, The Kaizen Way. It's available on amazon.com. Also check out his website at scienceofexcellence.com where you can find more information about his research and work and find more information about the other books he's published. Also check out our show notes at aom.is slash kaizen where you can find links to resources where you can delve deeper into this topic.